I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and uh, we have some tar sands, so, and all that natural capital. <laughs> And in 1991, I was, a, uh, I was a bureaucrat in the Alberta government. I spent 13 years there as a senior economist, advising the government on alternative, actually, new measures of progress. In fact, Alberta, like Oregon and Texas, led the way in terms of uh, accountability for uh, outcome-based budgeting. It was in Jerusalem that I actually woke up, um, that I realized I was going to become a priest or a, a monk <coughs> or something. Didn't know what I was supposed to do. But I realized I had to go back into economics and to, uh, I say, back into the temple of economics. Because economics, uh, economists are the high priest of society. And if you don't understand things like money, where money comes from, you don't understand anything. So it was in 92, I came back to, to Edmonton and got married. Six months later, I went back to my government job. And then in 1995, at my Delbert cubicle, Alberta Treasury, I came across a document called the Genuine Progress Indicator uh, out of Redefining Progress. And I thought, wow, this is audacious. First of, all, first of all, I already knew that natural capital wasn't getting counted in the national accounts. And I realized that we didn't have a balance sheet for the nation. We had a flawed income statement, which is what the GPI addresses. And I'll talk, to, talk about that in a minute. So we basically did not have a robust uh, measurement system for measuring what matters. And in 95, I thought, I have a dream. I'm going to do this GPI one day. I don't know, maybe, it's, maybe I won't do it in government because I won't be given permission to do it. But I will do it. And in 1998, I had the pleasure of, of uh, I applied for this job in San Francisco with Redefining Progress to actually um, take the job to oversee the GPI work. And I made it to the last interview got flown down to San Francisco, wine and dine. My wife said, where are the girls going to play? And, and I went. And then I did my own full, and I thought, i got to listen to her. Wait a minute. So I'm a spreadsheet geek, so I did a full cost accounting, what it would cost to live in San Francisco versus Edmonton. And I realized they couldn't pay me enough to work on my, this was the dream job for me. Like, it was, it was the most amazing thing I could ever imagine doing. Went back to Edmonton and said, no thanks and they ended up hiring me anyways, in, in terms of doing it on contract. So I learned, I've got the scars to prove it, how difficult it was to construct this genuine progress indicator, and why this was probably the most important work of economists in the next, you know, next generation of economists. But a lot of economic schools completely dismissed this work. People like Michael Porter, the godfather of productivity, said, you can't put a value on inequality. Um, but in that interview with Redefining Progress, I made the pitch that GPI is interesting. It's important because it, it addresses one of the flaws, which is GDP only counts everything that uh, any expenditures, right, on goods and services. Any, anytime money changes hands, uh, Laura already talked about what, what it doesn't count. And Kennedy said it measures the things that doesn't make life worthwhile. OK, so we have a flawed income statement, but we actually what we actually lack is a balance sheet for the nation or for a municipality. And I realized that the entire accounting system had to be revised. So in 99, I left my government job. You know, I did this work with, with the Redefining Progress as a senior fellow. I went to Washington, D.C. and you know, met Herman Daly and interviewed all these economists at the World Bank. And I said, what's the future of this stuff? Is it really? I mean, this is way before happiness. Is this thing really going to fly? You know, how can we make sure this thing, this work sticks? Because I knew the history of GDP from World War II. It was only introduced to, so the British could pay for the war. That's what John Maynard Keynes helped develop and Simon Kuznets. And both these fellows said eventually we would get to the point where we are today where we would actually be measuring the things that matter to our health and our well-being. That those things may not be monetized, but we will be measuring them. So here we are today. They foreshadowed that in the, in the the uh, mid-1940s. So again, that, that dream of let's think about all of these issues through the lens of conventional language, accounting, business. And that led me to uh, another dream. I said, I'm going to do this for Alberta. So in 2001, I secured about $160,000 uh, from the federal government 
uh, to do the first, what I call the Sustainable Wellbeing Accounting System for Alberta, in which I developed 50 indicators of well-being using the original US GPI, but actually creating a well-being index in addition to the full cost accounting uh, called the GPI. And look back, um, look back to when I was born. I was born in 1960, and uh, that's me when I'm three years old. I'm just going to Germany with my parents. My dad's from Germany. And, um, and so in this long path, you know, the creeds say that every child born is an answer to a prayer or a dream. And we're all in a state of development. This is actually the medicine wheel in indigenous culture. A medicine wheel is spiritual, mental, physical, emotional well-being. So how are we going to uh, construct a series of account accounts to measure the, the progress of, of society, of individuals? Because the other thing that I've learned, and you know this probably uh, you, with your children, is that all of us have gifts, all of us have aspirations, and when do we fully realize, when did you ever have a conversation about why you're here on this planet? What are your gifts? Mm -hmm.